So when the British started talking about independence and uh, the parliamentary elections and all that, I said, Dr. Ambedkar said, this person, the great person. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Brother Renoko Rashidi defines Dr. Ambedkar as someone that if you put Malcolm X, Garvey, Booker T, uh, Frederick, Martin Luther King, all together, roll them up, and you have Dr. Ambedkar. Unfortunately, the untouchable community has that only one person. We call him the savior, the emancipator. Okay. So he said, we need our own independence. We want our own representation. We want to elect our own people. But Gandhi said, no, you're Hindus. So we will elect you. But British said, to turn around to Gandhi, I said, you say, in the meantime, he was talking about, oh, I want to elevate everybody. I want to eradicate untouchability. But he didn't want to eradicate the caste system. He was a firm believer in caste system. But the world did not know that you can eradicate untouchability without eradicating caste system. Because they are one and the same. The reason why he, he doesn't want to, he did not want the caste system to be eradicated because the minute caste system eradicated, the Hindu religion disappears. For him, the religion is more important. Because that is their race. So he was in fact cheating the people, saying that he wants to eradicate untouchability. So the British Prime Minister at that time wrote him back. I said, you say you want to help these people. And this is one way to help these people to have their own representation. He said, so they went to England, London for a round table conference. There was a discussion. He said, Dr. Ambedkar is a thousand times more intelligent, more smart compared to Gandhi. So there's no way he could dis he can, he can argue. So he sat there silently in the round table conference. So the British thought Gandhi agreed. They even declared that the untouchables will have their own representation. This guy came back. He said, I will, I will not eat till I die if government, the British is going to uh, separate the untouchables from the Hindus. Gandhi was a hero. He was a god to the Hindus. So this guy went on fast, not eating. Three days, four days, five days. Things getting tense in India. And Dr. Ambedkar got a lot of threat that if something happens to Gandhi, you are gone, your people will be gone. And there is no doubt about it. Weak people so easy. So he was worried. But still he said, I'm not going to let my people down. I'm going to try my best to protect my people. But ultimately, there was, there was a point that he had to give up, give in rather. So he got a compromise. And that is the reason Dr. Ambedkar called Gandhi as number one enemy of the untouchables. Because today, without that particular action of Gandhi, the untouchables life would have been far, far better because we would have had our own representation. Today, according to the compromise, they said, okay, they designated certain constituencies for the untouchables. Because this district will be represented by untouchable, but would be elected by everybody. And the untouchables are never a majority in any district. Also, in the Indian uh, 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 process, election process, that you have to be nominated by your party. It is not like here. You got to be nominated by your own party to be uh, to contest an election, and all these parties are controlled by the upper caste. So people like me will never have a chance to be nominated. So they'll pick all these uh, dummies, and only those dummies are sitting there, and they would not open their mouth. They probably don't know how to open their mouth because that kind of people they elect them.
And that is the reason why when 10, 10 of our women are killed, raped and killed in India, you don't hear about it. These guys don't even stand up and talk about it. And I attribute that directly to this Gandhi. Gandhi also called our people as Harijan. I don't know whether you heard the word. Harijan means, Hari means God. Jan means children. Children of God. Dr. Ambedkar so, got so mad, I said, don't call our people with any sweet names. Call a slave a slave, the slave will revolt. You call a slave as the children of God, you are taming them a little more, making you a better slave. And that is exactly what he was doing. But in fact, it has got a different connotation. The word Harijan has a different connotation because the Hindu religion has so many evil practices. One of them is to make the young girls and women of untouchable community to be dedicated to the Hindu temples. This is one of the practices. It is called Devadasi system. See, these people, untouchable, are so ignorant, so absolutely uneducated, they think next life is going to be better if this Brahmin tells me whatever I should do, so he says, you have a nice looking girl, so you dedicate her to temple. So she can clean the temple around and dance and, and entertain the priests. Yes. And the children born out of those relationship, to me, they're called bastards. And they called Harijans. Because the fathers were close to God. And this word is coined almost about 50 years before Gandhi first introduced this word. A, a poet has already coined this word, calling these children as Harijans, meaning bastards. And Gandhi comes around and calls the entire community as Harijans. So Dr. Ambedkar got mad. I said, don't you ever use this word. And he even passed a resolution in the local uh, pa parliament. But the Hindus are the majority. They had the power. They introduced it and we are called Harijans. But today, we don't call that Harijans. We don't even call ourselves untouchables. We use the word untouchables in certain circumstances. They call us untouchable. There is no reason why we should call ourselves untouchable. Okay. So we call untouchables when we come to UN because that explains the truth, the naked truth. Otherwise, we call us Dalits, meaning broken and crushed. And this word also brought the people together. The reason why India, you know, is a fairly big country. It's not as big as the United States. It's only one third the size. <coughs> but, but the population today is almost close to a billion. Okay. India is divided by regions. Every region, they speak different languages. So an untouchable from one region has no connection with the untouchable of the region. That is number one. Number two, the beginning four major castes then the fifth caste is untouchable. Then what they did, they wanted, the Brahmins wanted to make sure these caste delineation stay within that framework. So they created what is called sub-caste, which is caste within the caste system. And then told them, you are higher and you are lower between the caste system. So the untouchables are already lowest. But among them, the certain untouchables were cleaning the roads, streets, the sweepers. Certain untouchables were cleaning the bathrooms. And certain untouchables were carrying the dead animals. So they said, your job is more filthier than your job. So you are upper caste and you are lower caste within the caste. So these guys are fighting with each other, trying to, trying to figure out who is upper and who is lower. And they've completely forgotten the, the enemy that he said they're supposed to be talking, to fighting against. So there are several reasons as to why 
there could not be any unity. We can never unite. Without unity we cannot fight. So this all worked against us. And Gandhi played his trick. So when, but when 47 came, when India about to leave, Indians have to write a constitution, new constitution. Do you believe that? Ultimately, they had to go to this untouchable to write the constitution. The person who wrote the constitution, they, they still claim this is one of the best constitutions, is same Dr. Ambedkar. So he took that as, as a chance to put a lot of guidelines into the constitution to help his people. To make sure that we get education, free education, we have jobs, all these protections. But that does not mean just because it is in the constitution, it is being practiced. What is written one thing, what is practiced other things. But within that, people like us, little lucky people, just able to creep off, crawl and come out. And that is how, like me, without that person, I would not be here. So for me, if there is a God, they tell me that I have to pray a God, and this is my God. He's my ancestor. So this is the man I should thank. These gods, all these gods have been there 3,000 years. They never even looked at me. As a matter of fact, they, they wouldn't even let me come close to them. <laughs> so that is, that is the Gandhi that I want to talk about a little more. And as a matter of fact, I want to go back and touch upon a couple of issues. Two things I want to talk about Gandhi. Number one, the so-called non-violence. <laughs> Then come back and tell you what he did specifically in South Africa. Before that, I want to say something about Gandhi. Most of the time when you hear Gandhi's name, you would hear as Mahatma Gandhi. But you, you haven't heard that word from me till now. Because when my savior, my emancipator, call this guy as number one enemy as untouchable, why should I call this guy a Mahatma? Mahatma means great soul. He, he was a great soul. He is a great soul for his race. Not for me. He, for me, he was an evil man. Nonviolence. What is nonviolence? Nobody defined nonviolence. People heard nonviolence. Anybody can say nonviolence. Probably even Hitler said sometimes nonviolence. <laughs> Does it mean that we need to glorify Hitler? That's exactly the African American community is doing in this country once a year during Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. When I came to this country, when I heard that, my blood boiled. My blood boiled. What is the people doing? I thought the African Americans are better educated yeah. compared to the untouchables in India. Yeah. Are they? No. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. May, yes, that, this guy Gandhi said nonviolence. You know, but you know what he meant by nonviolence? He said, hey, your master will hit you, but you don't hit you back, hit him back. That is the nonviolence you practice. Be nonviolent when somebody hits you. That is the definition of nonviolence this Mr. Gandhi used. I do not know whether Dr. Martin Luther King got the whole story or not. Obviously, he did not. But that's what Dr. John Henry Clark told me. Because I have a proof. I understand Dr. Clark tried his best to go to Dr. Martin Luther King to tell him the real Gandhi. But there are people around Dr. King who would not allow Dr. Clark to go close to Dr. King to tell the story. 
but it's time that we get to France. So what I did, I called the King Center several years back. I said, I want to talk to you guys. <laughs> they have a room called Gandhi Room in the King Center. I said, I want to tell you the truth about this man. Nobody would talk to me. They told me, no, 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 you need to talk to that person. No, that person's not there. Talk to that person. You leave your name and number, we'll call you back. <laughs> Never got a reason. Never got one. This person, I'm going to go back and read again about this Gandhi's nonviolence. Because I think when I read something, hopefully it will be uh, more clear than... Um, uh, let's see where I got the nonviolence. I want to even say a few things about what this Gandhi said about caste system. I can find no reason for their abolition. To abolish caste is to abol demolish Hinduism. So he knew very well. Yeah. If he if he abolish caste system, the the Hindu religion will be demolished. So he doesn't want to do that. And he, he, I think at that point I agree that he was an honest enemy. Okay. The most cruel statement he ever made was if anyone lived in India any length of period, one should know the pathetic condition under which the scavenger people live. Scavengers are the people who clean dry bathrooms, dry latrines, scoop those things into the bucket and carry them on their head and take it farther away from town to dispose them off. I have seen them carry, today there are at least half a million people doing this job. And many times those baskets will have holes. And sometimes they, they, they push a cart on the road and the people will run away from these people because it's so pathetic smell. This is the life of a scavenger. He does it every day, the whole day. And this guy makes a statement, why should my son not be a scavenger if I am one? If I'm a scavenger, there's nothing wrong with my son being a scavenger. That is a statement is made. That is the most cruelest statement ever anybody can make. Any shred of humanity would never make a statement. This statement alone is a proof that how cruel this person was. If I were a doctor, what's wrong my son being a doctor, I have no problem accepting that statement. If I were a priest, even though that is, logically that's not correct. It should be depending upon the head this boy has. What kind of brain he has. But I have no problem accepting the sense. It's not a cruel statement. But this guy is cleaning latrines, bathrooms, day in and day out. And, he, and if he were a scavenger, would he ever make a statement? If he did, I wouldn't consider him as a parent. Because no parent will ever want their children to do the kind of work. No parent, no matter how idiotic the parents are. But this, he made the statement because he didn't have to do it. His children didn't have to do it. Only his slaves were doing it. This is the kind of statement and I hope in future, whenever you see Gandhi name mingled with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's birth race, I hope you would bring up this point. It's very important. He also says, it is good thing, he was talking about, somebody asked him a question, one of the British asked him a question, what if this guy, a certain caste, does some other caste duty, job, you know, crossing the caste duty, he says, it is good thing 
for him not to arrogate varna to which he is not born i mean he's not supposed to if he's not born in that caste he is not supposed to do that it is a, by not doing it it's a sign of true humility humility according to hindu belief a person who practices a profession which does not belong to him by birth belongs to the varna in which he is born no matter what profession he practices but by not living up to it he will be doing violence to himself and become a degrading being it's all gone these statements it's all gone these statements i believe in caste division determined by birth underline birth and very root of caste division lies in birth this is a drug court from gandhi if you have anyone ever say that this guy worked for casteless society they they still make a statement if you talk to a, the hindu here they'll say oh gandhi worked for caste abolition <coughs> they have not read it they didn't want to read it they want to keep on lying but these are the facts as a matter of fact he says uh, oh here he says shudra who only serves the higher caste as a matter of religious duty and will and who will never own any property the gods will shower down flowers on him <laughs> this is the icing on the cake then he makes a statement how is it possible that the untouchable should have the same right to enter all the existing temples as long as law of caste and karma has the chief place in hindu religion to say that every hindu can enter every temple is a thing that is not possible today this is the non violent peace loving gandhi okay <coughs> i think somebody says gandhi was perhaps 20th century most cunning and crafty fox in a saint's garb <coughs> the credit for saving hinduism and transferring india from british imperialist to more dangerous brahmin imperialist goes to gandhi that is that's what he did he killed untouchables with his kindness it is a kiss of death <coughs> gandhi was a double edged weapon he used religion to fight a political war and to fight a uh, fight the fire of socio economic struggle he deceived everybody with sweet words non violence was he non violent simplest question i ask if gandhi were non violent how come during 47 the during independence partition there are thousands and thousands of people were killed in india anybody who remember the events during 47 you know before 47 india was a big country part 47 india became two countries india and pakistan at that time they had west pakistan and east pakistan then later on east pakistan became bangladesh the reason is because those two regions were given for muslims because muslims wanted to have their own country because they said they couldn't live with the hindus so they had because of their concentration population concentration they had west pakistan and east pakistan the later on the west pakistan uh tried to oppress the east pakistans so they had a fight and and india played the devil's role and got uh, pakistan broken into two pieces so that became bangladesh and this became pakistan <coughs> okay but during that time hundreds of thousands of people were killed non violent bloodless violence and then millions hundreds of people killing it doesn't make any sense but you keep 
hearing these lies again and again and again. He also calls during that time, if the whole of Calcutta swims in blood, it will not dismay me. This is a direct quote from Gandhi. A nonviolent person talking like this? Either nonviolence has a different definition, or somebody doesn't know what he's talking about. Actually, one person said, it would be difficult to find a more violent person than Gandhi in the history. Because most of the violent people declare themselves as violent. Except Gandhi, who cheated the entire world, portrayed himself as a pacifist. But in fact, he was a hardcore violent person within himself when it came to protecting his evil Hindu caste system. That is exactly the truth. During his stay in South Africa, I want to go back and read a little more in detail because I think that's the most important thing. Before that, I want to show this book, Gandhi, Saint or Sinner. <laughs> this is an important book every African American has to read because this is an absolute documentation of what he did in South Africa. And I'll make sure Brother Yununi has address or I will try to get these books and give it to them because this has got documentation. What he said, when he said in South Africa. This, I'll, I'll give the details because I'll, I think best thing because it is, it is available only in India. It's kind of difficult for you individually write them so what I'm thinking of doing is to get a bulk and then and send it to here is easier because of the exchange rates and the, and, and the, and the postal system. And half the time your check won't receive or they'll take the check and they'll say they never got the checks. <laughs> okay. He says, you know, during the Gandhi movie, people forgot Gandhi for a long time. And the Indian government, the Indira Gandhi government, to, to bring his Gandhi back, their, their, their uh, Mahatma back, the movie was completely financed by the Indian government. The script was checked and rechecked by the government of India. And the movie was taken. And uh, one commentary about this movie. While Gandhi is being portrayed as a saintly man, a martyr for whom nonviolence is constant theme and growing virtue, Gandhi was an opportunist, a late blooming pacifist for whom nonviolence non was a selective tactic. In fact, during the Kafir Wars in South Africa, he was a regular Ganga Din who volunteered to organize a brigade of Indians to put down Zulu up, uprising and was decorating himself for valor under fire. Oh. You should know that. Yeah. Is, it, is it the King Center people can't even get this fact? <laughs> <coughs> and I want to quote some of his writing when he was in South Africa. I don't think any of you would, would want to keep quiet after I read this. He says, ours, that is the Indian upper caste community in South Africa, is one continued struggle sought to be inflicted upon us by the Europeans who desire to degrade us to the level of the raw kafir, whose occupation is hunting, and whose sole ambition is to collect a certain number of cattle to buy a wife and then pass his life in indolence and nakedness. This is Mr. Gandhi's writing when he was in South Africa. A few years back, later, there was a, a regulation, a gun, the arm carrying control the Europeans were implementing. And obviously, Europeans wanted to make a rule same for the native blacks and the Indians. He is calling, there is a certain class of bill. He says, class 200 makes provision for registration of persons belonging to 
uncivilized races, meaning the local Africans, resident employed within the barrow. One can understand the necessity of registration of coffees who will not work. But why should registration be required to the Indians? He goes on, in the majority of cases, it compels a native to work for at least a few days a year. Meaning, the locals were lazy, they'll never work. Then it goes on another time, we believe as such in the purity of race, as we think as the whites do, by advocating the purity of all races. This is Mr. Gandhi's statement. We believe in purity of races as much as the Europeans believe in purity of races. So far as British Indians, Indians are concerned, such a thing in particularly is unknown of mixing races. If there is one thing which the Indians cherishes, when I say Indians, it means upper caste, cherishes more than anything else, more than any other person, it is the purity of the type of race. Aryan. Now, can you call Hitler calling himself Aryan, the Aryan race? You know where he got the Aryan? He went back to India. You know the swastika sign? You know where he borrowed that from? From the Indian religion. That is a sign of Indian religion. That's where he borrowed. The Aryan purity and the sign, swastika sign, both came from Indian religion. And that is what he is re-emphasizing here. So, this book goes through much more in detail about Mr. Gandhi. So you have a non-violent Gandhi and a racist Gandhi, which is really, see, the, the mistake a lot of our people make, the whole non-violence or violence. When the word violence is used, right away they think as a gun or a dagger or a, or a stick, a blood. No. It's much more than that. You can be a non-violent person. Let me t redefine that. You can be an extremely violent person without using a gun or a shower or a knife. That is what they have done to the untouchables. The day a child was born, they said, you are untouchable. You are, you are worth for nothing. We wouldn't, you have no brain. You can't think, you can't teach, you can't do anything. So he, he completely destroyed the person. I never had any self-respect. I never loved myself. As a matter of fact, I hated myself when I was a child. That is much, 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 much more cruel violence than if somebody would have taken a gun and shot me down. <coughs> people don't, people don't, people have to understand when they, the, the word of violence and non-violence is being used to their advantage. It requires little bit education and sometimes we were denied that education or most of the time we were denied the education but it's about time that we wake up because that is where I'm coming back the, the Gandhi who killed the untouchables are, has the same ancestry as the African Americans of this country so how can you glorify this man who not only killed the untouchables in India, but also went against the Africans in South Africa, and then you are glorifying here in this country. Last year, during October, that is the time this guy was born, October, some date. The, the, the Hindus in this country are very powerful. They have a lot of money. They can buy any politicians. They obviously bought some uh, uh, city council members in Atlanta. So 
So they said, we want to name a street after Gandhi. Right next to King Center. With the blessing of Mrs. King. So, this, this uh, brother, African American council brother, fine. He moved a resolution and it has to go through legal proceedings. So they put an ad in the notice in the legal section. How many of us read the legal section in the paper? Nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. None of the African American, uh, the, 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 the awakened African American brothers knew what's going on. But you know, there are Indian run newspaper in this country. And one of them carried an, uh, an article. They were jo joyous of oh, we're going to have a name after Gandhi, that to an African American street. They didn't know I'm going to read that paper. <laughs> I read the paper. I called right away our brothers and sisters in Atlanta. And I want to give credit to those brothers and sisters because they did work hard. John, Brother John Trimble, his wife Tandai, and sister Kadai, Sharon Davis. These three people got to work. They put together a little pamphlet, important aspect of this Gandhi, what he was. Went to door to door in the street, educated our brothers and sisters. The day of hearing came in the city hall. All the Hindus had their champagne bottles ready. <laughs> They were ready to open the car. There came John Trimble and Sister Jaron Davis. They stood and told him who Gandhi was. Nobody could believe, obviously Hindus couldn't believe, that anybody would dare talk against their, their God, blessed by King Center. <laughs> so, we won the race. That that was completely shelved. But their brother, council brother, I believe, promised the Hindus that I'll find another street. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we suspect this time they're going to do it in such a way nobody's going to find out. But, but we're going to keep our eyes and ears open. Okay. But that is only a small battle they won so far in the process of education. The bigger one is coming in DC. The powerful, powerful Hindu lobby was able to buy a lot of senators and they were pushing a bill through the Senate, U.S. Senate, to create a memorial for Gandhi in D.C. Where 70% of the population is African Americans. Where is the memorial for all these African Americans who have been killed and lynched and raped in this country. Where is it? There is a memorial for Holocaust. Where did it happen? It happened somewhere else. And, 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 and a memorial here in, in, in government land? What are we doing? What are our elected congressmen doing up in Washington, D.C.? The Black Congressional Caucus, what is it doing? But, we are not going to let another traitor's memorial come in there. We are not going to allow Gandhi's memorial come into D.C. I have gone to D.C. and met our brothers and sisters, and they have everybody who promised us we will fight it. And I have already sent all these details to all the, uh, the, the senators who were involved in this bill. And one senator wrote me back and said, we may have difference in opinion about Mr. Gandhi. Difference of opinion? Difference of opinion. It's much more than that. 200 million people being persecuted is difference of opinion for him. Because it doesn't affect his race. It does not affect his race. So I, I do have one, one appeal. I may want to come back to you when this memorial business comes serious, I would expect every one of us to at least write or call our senators. Maybe a massive letter writing campaign. Because if such a memorial comes into DC, it is not only an insult to the 
black people of India, but it's an insult to the entire black African community in this world. They have been running over us too long. They have been running over too long. We need to stop it. We got to stand up and say, this is it. We are not going to take it anymore. Yesterday, I had, we had another celebration in Columbia University. That is where Dr. Ambedkar got his MS and PhD. See, every year, a small group of Dalits living in this country, we get together and, and celebrate his birthday. His birthday is act, uh, April 14th, but depending upon the convenience, they, so yesterday was there, uh, we were, I was there, there was a big, <coughs> some of our African-American brothers and sisters also attended that. He fought a lot of hurdles. He went through one man, one man, one untouchable, had to fight against this monster Gandhi and the whole entourage, very powerful upper caste. The reason why he was able to withstand because of towering intelligence, dedication, dedication, as the most commitment, he had that. Because he could have been anything he wanted. He could have been a, a, a big governor or president of the country if he would have wanted. Because they would rather give him and push him aside, keep his mouth shut, maybe send a few white women with him, take care of him. That is a tactic they use, you know that, right? As a matter of fact, they did it to him. Dr. Ambedkar's uh, first wife died. He was, he was a ba uh, bachelor, uh, um, widower for a while. He got sick, he went to the hospital. Nehru, you know the guy, the, the first prime minister. He introduced a, a physician, a Brahmin girl, to Dr. Ambedkar, and ultimately they got married. And within about six years, Dr. Ambedkar died. And there is no investigation. The, the, the untouchable community wanted an investigation as to why this man died. He never introduced this lady. It's a gradual death. He got sicker and sicker and sicker. But Dr. Ambedkar called our people and told them three things. In order to emancipate, you got to ed educate, you got to agitate, and you got to organize. Okay? But I want to I elaborate these things a little better. When I was a young boy in India, there used to be demonstrations. You know, for everything, there is a Communist Party is, is, is a, uh, an uh, accepted or a legal party in India. They always demonstrate. You know, they walk and labor demonstrations and, and 100 people, 200 people, 500 people demonstrating. I assumed that as an agitation. You know, demonstration, to me, I thought it was an agitation. And you can agitate when you have a whole bunch of people. So I thought that is an organization. So you need to organize in order to agitate. But Dr. Ambedkar said, educate and then agitate, he said. I said, what is this? I don't understand. You know why I didn't understand? Because I didn't get my proper education. I had a bachelor's degree in engineering at that time. I thought to myself, man, I'm an educated man. No, I wasn't educated. As I said earlier, I was just illiterate. Education comes within. You don't have to go to college to get educated. So once you get educated, once you understand who you are, where you came from, where you are going, why you are where you are, you get educated. Once you get agitated, educated, you automatically get agitated. You get angry. You get mad. If you don't get mad, you haven't gotten educated enough. Yeah. 
so once you are agitated once you are agitated we become together that is the organization without that there is no organization so this is the important lesson dr ambedkar told our people and i think that applies to everybody particularly the african american community when i went to back to india 1988 they asked me how do we help our people because every time a guy gets a degree he gets a job he runs away from the community <laughs> he wants to act like a bra- brahmin <laughs> he dresses like a brahmin he talks like a brahmin <laughs> he became he became a sophisticated slave we see our youngsters wandering around without direction because we are not giving direction we are not giving direction we ourselves don't know which direction we are going because we are not educated so this applies for our society for our our race and i don't know how long i've been talking how much time i got I'm, <laughs> I want to well I want to give some time for people to question me but I want to go back and close my talk with uh, some of the uh, uh, writings of Dr Ambedkar this is his picture and uh, one of these days uh, I think brother Yunini has a copy of his biography and uh, that tells you the story of an untouchable Before I read I want to make one more mention about this Gandhi movie when um, <coughs> a British film producer went to India to make a movie on Nehru again financed by the government every village he went he saw a statue garlanded mainly in the poor section of the area so he asked somebody who is this guy everywhere I go I see a guy with the glasses to an brahmin obviously because he is the guide he told him oh he's a some poor guy's guy you know we let's not talk about him this guy came back and said if that guy is poor why do i see his statue every village <laughs> he found out the who he was dr ambedkar he went back and did some research then he found out he is the greatest person born in india the reason why nobody talked about it because he was born as an untouchable in front of dr Ma, dr ambedkar gandhi was a dwarf not even an ordinary person intellectually honesty humanity you take it i have given you enough information to prove that so what he came back to england he talked to his financiers and said let's take a movie on dr ambedkar so he wrote the script he got everything he applied for visa to go to india visa was denied they call that biggest democracy in india biggest democracy in the world that's what you hear all the time india is the biggest practicing democracy the person could not even take a movie on a person who wrote the constitution of india but you don't hear about it nobody would talk about it even today the movie is not taken because we are powerless we have no money if we had the power you think 200 million people being oppressed every day and it is not being talked about in the united nations that 3000 4000 years continuously being uh, oppressed and nobody talks about it if you want to single out one national world issue and this should be the issue but you don't hear about it because it is supposed to be like that because the gods have already written down so this is one more thing the book that you uh, you probably seen the dalit the black hunters of india 
The writer, his name is V.T. Rashegar. His passport is impounded. He, he can leave the country. Because if he leaves the country, he's going to talk about the untouchable. He's going to talk about the caste system. And they call this democracy? They call this independent country? We wrote even letters to government to give, get his passport back. Nothing. The so-called uh, American government, uh, democracy, all freedom-loving. Nothing. They don't care. Nobody even listened to us. Nobody even wanted to hear about our problems. But this is the facts. Brother, brother, if brother Rajshagar would come here and stand here, he is an electrifying person. He devoted his entire life for this. He is, he is a, if any one of you have read his writings, such a powerful writing, a powerful speaker, he talks nothing but truth, facts. And facts hurt. So best thing is to keep him shut. And in spite of the fact he is the, the Dalit voice, I'm sure some of you would have seen this book. This is a journal that comes every other week, twice a, twice a month. Dalit voice. And uh, very powerful. But he's, we are still worried about his life. Because the Hindus will do anything. Because they don't want anybody else to know what's going on in India. So this is a couple of examples of democracy. But one of our brothers in Toronto, his Dalit brother, for the last three years relentlessly working through some of his contacts in government of Canada, he was able to go to United Nations Human Rights Organization. And this, last two weeks back, there is going to be a World Human Rights Conference in June. Before that, they had regional conferences. One was in Bangkok for the Asia side. And this brother is able to bring a resolution. And I want to read it to you. We call on the UN to take appropriate step to eradicate the practice of untouchability, which is a crime against humanity and discrimination on the basis of caste, religion, and other facts by year 2000, failing which actions will be imposed. I'm sorry, sanctions will be imposed. So we have taken one step after all these years. But the government of India has already denied, they said, we don't have any caste system. Our, our, our constitution says there is no caste system. There is no uh, untouchability. It says that the constitution says no untouchability. But a high level police officer, a couple of years back, made a comment. So there is a, a, a constitutional amendment for uh, eradication untouchability. If anybody practices a certain punishment to be given. And he, this officer says, if we have to implement that particular law, we have to arrest at least half the population of the state. He doesn't stop there. He says, then we have no business in imposing ourselves into the private affairs of the people. This is a court. So what is written on a piece of paper and what is being practiced is entirely two different things. 80% of Indians live in villages. 80% of Indians live in villages. And in every village, the untouchability community is a small community. They were designed in such a way, they are entirely minorities. And they are completely depending upon the upper caste. Because they have the wealth, they have everything. So the constitution, the law, order, police, nothing works in those villages. The village is the same old caste hierarchy works every day. And before I uh, uh, read uh, some quotes from Dr. Ambedkar, I want to read you some latest newspaper cuttings, some of the atrocities. And for every one atrocities reported in the papers, nine go unnoticed, unreported. 
because most of the time the perpetrators are the police and the politicians. So where are you going to report to them? <coughs> and you report to them, next day you won't be there. So what you hear is just the tip of the iceberg. There is a couple of, um, in 1988, one of the untouchable boys, just a boy, happened to touch a cigar of an upper caste man by accident. You know what was the punishment? The punishment was he was beaten, he was supposed to drink urine and eat excrement. The proof is right here. The proof is right here. And, and you call that of democracy, you call the independence. And right after that incident, in another town, another village, the same thing happened because the person happened to cut the grass in somebody's land. And he was forced to, they, they brought bread, smeared excrement on that, and forced them to eat. It's reported in the paper. What do you call that? Forty, another incident, 14 policemen raped 25 women and looting the whole village. Village of untouchables. You know, these are all untouchables. Untouchable women. They're not supposed to be touched. But when, when, when women and the light goes off, untouchability disappears. <laughs> this is uh, in Los Angeles Times. There's a quote, caste Hindus do not allow outcasts, as they are called, or untouchables, to wear shoes, ride bicycles, use umbrellas, drink from the main village well, or hold their heads up while walking in the street. 1990. 1990. Not 1790. This is what happened today. This is a classical example of the type of atrocities going on in India. What they do, they have listed a whole bunch of massacres. 10 people, 20 people killed. They go through about 10 listing. Then, a follow paragraph. But cold statics, sta statistics do not speak of the horror which has accompanied every killing. In one place, the raiders prepared a funeral fire, lined up the untouchables, shot them and tossed the bodies in one by one. In another place, raiders surrounded the area where the untouchable are living, set, set fire to their houses, and when men, women, and children fled outside, it was only to be tossed right back into the inferno. Another place, the virtually same repeat, the only difference being that the victims were not allowed to come out at all. They were roasted alive. In another village, Men of a particular sect were captured. Three extremists brutally hacked their bodies into pieces and thrown them into the nearby river. Mere killing have never been enough in that particular place. Their power must be demonstrated. Extremists hanged people, including women, on suspicion of being police informers. Beheading is usually the type. The usual type is cut their, chop their head off. We will chop your head off. That is the quote. You better behave properly or we will chop your head. In one place, 11 members including five women were beheaded. This shows a little bit of the goriness of what's going on in India, not 100 years back, today. Actually, Washington Post said untouchables, of course, they still use the word Harijans. In 15 minutes, they killed 10 persons, including five women and two children. 
and severely wounded other two. They killed the Harijans like rabbits. The reason is that they should not have the, they, not, they, they should not question their low status. Just by questioning as to why we are low, how dare you ask that question? Shoot them down. The assertion of their right has caused active hostility among the vested interests in rural areas. This is a painful cast riot kill seven over wedding procession. The only thing the bridegroom wanted is to ride a horse during a ceremony. And he was, seven people were killed because that tradition was only the upper caste. Only upper caste can ride horses during the weddings. Seven people were killed and 50 people were absconded, meaning killed. This is 1990, July 1990. This is probably the one very well publicized. It came in Time magazine, every newspaper in the country. A young, untouchable girl, just married. The husband and wife both were working for the a landlord, upper caste landlord, and he wanted the girl to go to his room. The husband said no. So he called a couple of his assistants. They held them, poured corn and kerosene, and set fire in front of his own wife. This is reported in, again, I think, 19... Uh, 90 or 91, very recent. And so ultimately they, they took the body to the nearest police, uh, hospital. The doctor wouldn't touch it. The police would not register a case. Till after two months, somehow they got leaked up and one lady of our uh, 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 untouchable lady who was a member of parliament brought it up and so it, it came into the paper. A follow-up story on this story uh, gives a little bit of the brut brutality of the situations. In a long list of brutalities committed against India's untouchables, the lowest the low in the country's rigid caste structure. Caste only underscores how, despite special laws aimed at protecting them, Harijans face despicably high levels of oppression. Last week, I think this was in 1990 again, a Harijan woman was reportedly burnt to death after being gang raped by three men. In 1989, more than 14,000 anti-untouchable atrocities, including 759 rapes, 479 murders, were registered. That is what was registered. 14,000. That rape is uh, 759. But every rape you have to multiply by at least 10. Countless other were unrecorded because victims fear the police who are themselves frequently the perpetrators. Other cruelties against Harjans are considered just as part of local custom. Listen to this. An untouchable couple can consummate their marriage only after the landlord has deflowered the bride. Time magazine writes. Time magazine writes. So this is some of the atrocities going on. And the funny thing is this is an ad in the Indian paper here local. Adopt a cow. The Hindus in this country, they, because that is their holy cow, they're adopting cows. <laughs> they want to, because they are non-violent people. <laughs> non-violent people. I'm going back to read some of Dr. Ambedkar's writing because some of them will apply to the local condition. I got quite a bit uh, marked, but I'm going to just read a few of them. 
better to die in prime of your youth for a great cause than live like a woke and do nothing. This is Dr. Ambedkar wrote to our people. Lost rights are never regained by begging and by appeals to the conscience of the usurpers, but by resentless, uh, relentless struggle. I think we can never beg our freedom. We, not, we cannot expect wolves to protect the lambs. The wolf may assure protection during the day, but in the night, it will quietly eat the lambs one by one. Next morning, the very same wolf may shed tears over the disappearance of one lamb. <coughs> it may talk of ahimsa, ahimsa means non-violence. It may talk of non-violence, give lectures on peace, equality and brotherhood. But every night another lamb will disappear. Wolf is wolf, lamb is lamb. They cannot live together except in circus. But even in circus, but even in circus, two are, these two are brought together with the ringmaster's whip. It is my solemn vow to die in the service and cause of those untrot, under, downtrodden people among whom I was born, I was brought up, and I am living. I would not budge an inch from my righteous cause of protecting my people. This is what he had. That is the reason the one man was able to bring about this much of emancipation. Then he goes on and says, whatever I have done, I have done, I have been able to do after p passing through crushing mi miseries and endless troubles all my life and fighting with my opponents. With, with great difficulty, I have brought this caravan where it is seen today. Let the caravan march, march on despite the hurdles that may come its way. If my lieutenants are not able to take the caravans ahead, they should leave it there. But under no circumstances should they allow the caravan to go back. This is my message to my people. You must abolish your slavery yourself. Do not depend its abolition by God or Superman. <laughs> This is his saying. And no superman, no god is going to abolish our slavery. And that thing applies irrespective of where we are talking about. When there was no way left for constitutional methods, methods for achieving economic and social objectives, there was a great deal of justification for unconstitutional methods. Because the man who wrote the constitution. Okay. He also wrote, I hope I can get that particular item where he is talking about how he puts his people above the law. I will close with this remark. Ambedkar said in the House of the Provincial Assemblies, whenever there has been a conflict between my personal interest and the interest of the country as a whole, I have placed, I have always placed the claims of the country above my personal claims. But I will also leave no doubt in the minds of the people of this country that I have another loyalty to which I am bound and which I will never forsake. That loyalty is the community of untouchables in which I am born, in which I belong, in which I hope I shall never desert. And I say to this house as strongly as I possibly can that whenever there is a conflict of interest between the country and the untouchables, so far as I'm concerned, the untouchables' interest will come, will take precedence over the interests of the country. Yeah. That is the type of leaders we need. That is the type of leaders we need. There is another book. Hopefully I will get some of these. History of the Indian imperialism. This deals with the real Brahminical Hinduism. 